Thanks everyone for joining us uh, on this panel on age verification in the internet. Um, this is actually a very timely panel uh, because just this week uh, the California legislature passed the California Age Appropriate Design Code Act, um, which will have pretty big implications, not just for uh, how children use the internet, but how everyone uh, uses the internet. Uh, so we're excited to talk about that later in the panel. Um, but we can start with some introductions. My name is Bailey Sanchez. I'm a policy counsel at Future Privacy Forum. Uh, we are a nonprofit that focuses on advancing uh, principled like privacy protective uh, measures in emerging technology. Hi, I'm Heidi Tandy. I am on the legal committee for the Organization for Transformative Works. I'm in private practice as a partner with Berger Singerman in Florida, and I've been in the terms of use and privacy space since 1994. Hey everyone, my name is Eric Null. I am the Director of Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a, a nonprofit that sort of spans a bunch of different issues, including like freedom of expression, First Amendment, surveillance, uh, privacy, obviously, democracy, uh, and elections, and, and so forth. Cool. Uh, so I think a good place to start is just like a very, very brief overview of what uh, COPPA is uh, and kind of like why it matters. And I think that'll level set um, and help us kind of um, explain why this new California bill is such a big deal. Um, so COPPA has a requirement What does that, COPPA stand for? Uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, you might have heard about it in 2019. There was a very like buzzy uh, YouTube settlement with COPPA, and it got a lot of people talking about it uh, when that happened. Um, so COPPA requires verifiable parental consent before you collect any data from a child under 13. Um, so it's often why you see a lot of websites that'll say, you know, this is not for um, anyone under 13. And so as websites try to determine like who is using their website, often they will use uh, what's called age verification or age gating to kind of screen out uh, people that are under 13. Uh, so it's not required, but it's something that just we often see. Um, do you guys have any examples? Uh, you, Heidi, you're a parent, so um, where do you see this? Well, although my kids are a little bit older, um, but basically one of the, so I remember back when COPPA was originally passed and uh, the regulations manifested, if you were a parent, you had to send in your permission for your children to be able to access a website via the fax machine. Now, obviously in the late 90s and the earlier 2000s, more people had fax machines at home than they do now. And now we have very easy ways, you know, by e-fax, you can send a fax um, without having to print and write and use, you know, thermal paper. Does anyone still have thermal paper? Um, but it's still a major imposition for a website to have to do that in connection with content, with personally identifying information collection. And of course, the definition of personally identifying information is a weird one. In other words, if you're looking to the GDPR definition, it includes things like IP addresses. If you're also, if you're looking to the GDPR, it includes things like your religious information and um, your sexual orientation, but when they were writing it, they forgot that heterosexuality is an orientation. So anytime that you identify that you're a woman who identifies their spouse as a man, you're giving away your uh, that bit of personally identifying information. Obviously, it's different when you're talking about people under the age of 12 themselves, but their parental information may include that kind of information about you know the genders of their parents and by doing that basically there's no way that you can be completely compliant with the gdpr and with COPPA without having extensive amounts of information provided as part of your policies which is one of the reasons why a lot of websites avoid allowing content um, and information gathering from those under the age of 13 or try to so why are we doing this in the first place like why what's going on. Uh, COPPA was passed in 1998. Um, there was a lot of concern of really like protecting uh, protecting kids online because uh, the internet was thought of as like the Wild West. Uh, honestly, not dissimilar to uh, some of the, the discourse right now and protecting kids online, but the context is also uh, very different from what was going on in the 90s. Heidi, you mentioned that you've been doing this for quite a while. Can you explain 
a bit more like what it was like on the ground at the time. So show of hands if anybody had a blue ribbon um, from the EFF on their um, web page that they created back in 95 or 96. Okay, only me. Um, so basically there were other regulations um, that were coming out of Congress in the mid-90s, including in 95 when, or 96 when Bill Clinton basically signed um, Communications Decency Act, which was the subject of a lot of litigation, um, because it would have made the entire internet have to be safe for children. No definition of whether that was under the age of 17, under the age of 13, every, you know, children who were six years old. So of course it was the subject of a lawsuit, um, and I think it was ACLU won, and that created this whole ramification where people were like, okay, so if the internet has to be safe for grown-ups, can we at least manifest some sort of a carve-out for those under the age of 13 so that they can't go and log on and create accounts and do certain things on various websites? So they put a lot of things in um, into this um, COPPA legislation to basically try and create something for brands that were directed to kids, sugary cereals, McDonald's, Disney. So if you go on archive.org and you look at the um, privacy and terms of use agreements for go.com circa 1999 and 2000, you'll see a lot of explanation there about how things need to be faxed in to allow your child to access information about Disney. Yeah, so that is kind of how we got COPPA. Really, the thought process behind it is the best way to protect kids online is really to, to give the parents the tool to do that. Um, so if you're under 13 and you want to give your information to a website, uh, you just you get your parents' permission, um, and then that process can be facilitated. Um, there was a lot of like discourse at the time on like what the appropriate age is. 13 is what was set, and that's kind of like how the U.S. has approached um, kids' privacy ever since. Um, so if you are a child and you want to go on like like the Lego app or something, um, what you would do is it like you get a trigger to um, to go get your parent, and then your parent has to do a series of different things. Um, it can include uh, providing their government issued ID, and that is checked against a database. It can include doing like a video conference um, with someone to verify that it is a parent. Um, it can include a series of knowledge-based questions. It can also include providing your uh, credit card information. Um, so if you're listening, you're hearing that those are all like various types of information um, that uh, the parent is instead giving in order for their child to have a safe experience online. Um, and there are some like accessibility concerns with that as well because um, you know, not everyone um, is, some people are unbanked, um, some people don't have a government issued ID. Um, and it requires the parent to be putting forward like substantial information um, for the benefit of their child. It also manifests limitation for education technology. Um, at the start of the school year, there's a lot of schools that have paperwork for the parents to sign that basically gives de facto power of attorney authorization to the teachers or to the administrators to get permission for their child to be able to use edutech. But again, there are some barriers in connection with that. Um, language gaps, definitional differences, concerned by the parents as to whether or not they're willing to let the teacher make the final decision as to what their child is going to be able to access online. But it also causes issues for the educational process because um, students who are 13 years old and up are going to be in classes with kids who are 12, especially in the seventh and eighth grade middle school component. So there are going to be things that if your parent hasn't approved of something, you may not be able to do the same kind of a project that your classmates are doing just because you're three weeks younger. I think we've seen over the last 20 some odd years that this, this law is incredibly difficult to enforce because some of the early ways to determine whether someone was 13 or older was an age game, which is tell us how old you are or tell us what your birthday is then they would use that information to determine whether they had to protect you based on you being under 13 or if they could do whatever they wanted with your data uh, if you were over 13 <clears throat> or 13 year older. And of course, lots of sites would just say, if you're under 13, you're not allowed to access our service or you're not allowed to use our service. I mean, Facebook famously said this for many, many years, even though we knew that hundreds of thousands of children under the age of 13 were using Facebook. So, and then there, of course, you know, 
parents can tell their kids to lie about their age because parents also might be working two jobs and so they don't have time to send in a photo of themselves or do the teleconference or uh, you know whatever whatever burden was required on the parents they very likely are just like oh I don't care just tell them you're 13 just tell them you're 50 and you can use the service and who cares right like that's just this it's a burden that's placed on the parents and um, you know I, I was on the panel earlier today about a comprehensive privacy law that's coming out and the same thing there is like stop putting the onus, stop putting the privacy onus on the people who are using the service because we don't have time for that. Nobody has time to read all the privacy policies. No one has time to go through this process for to comply with COPPA. They just say whatever, just go use the internet. I don't care. Um, if a parent's really going to be like strict about it, then they won't let the kid use the internet at all. They're not going to say like they're not going to have to try to draw some arbitrary line. Um, so it's it, it has shown itself to be very difficult to enforce, and even with the best of intentions, it, it has ended up not being as effective or as useful as I think the 1998 Congress hoped it would be. So um, yeah, you ended up mostly just having uh, sort of a two-tiered internet of like kids under 13 just can't access a lot of services, which also means they're not accessing information that we would want them to be reading. And so it, it's, it, it has caused a lot of issues for children's access to information as well. Uh, all, in, all in the, the you know, good intention of trying to protect kids from harmful content or from uh, being, being contacted by strangers on the internet. Obviously, no one supports that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of good intention behind the law, but it just hasn't panned out as well as good. Well, and also, there's one little bit of temporality that I was thinking of when I was flying up here today, and that is that time-wise, the, um, obviously the Communications Decency Act, but also COPPA, were much closer in time to the PMRC, the Parents Music Resource Center, you know, John Denver and Dee Snyder testifying that we shouldn't have, you know, a government body making judgments about what music should and should not be banned and played on the radio. Um, that was much closer in time to each other than the first iteration of COPPA was to us now here in 2022. You know, it's it's coming on 25 years, and they've obviously updated certain aspects of it. Yay, we can avoid faxes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they've made the full-scale review of how the internet may be different now than it was in 19. Yeah, and I think it's very fair to say that kids are a lot more online than they were in the 90s. Uh, we saw that especially once the pandemic happened where um, they were not just like online in their private life, but like they were going to school online and spending a substantial portion of their time online. Um, and there's a lot of debate about screen time. And it, I think it, uh, in my personal opinion, it focuses, uh, I think that issue with screen time is more like quality versus quantity. Um, screens can be fine. Uh, being online is fine. Um, it's just a matter of like figuring out what like an age appropriate experience is. And Papa, Papa's pretty black and white on ages. It's either under 13 or over 13. It doesn't make a distinction between um, you know, uh, age appropriate content for a 12 year old. And I think a 12 year old versus a five year old um, have very different online experiences. And especially when you get closer to the higher end of um, the COPPA age range, like a 12 year old is very likely to want to be accessing content that they might be restricted from accessing. Um, and because there's no federal privacy law, it's kind of like it goes from like, you have this very strict, um, you need your parent permission to do mostly anything on a website uh, to then, you know, you turn 13 and go out there and uh, do what you want on the internet. You're, you can give your information to whoever. Um, so it doesn't necessarily uh, protect kids in that transition period as they're like learning how to be uh, good digital citizens and um, just operating responsibly online. I'm sure everybody in the audience remembers when they turned 13 and they all of a sudden understood everything they were doing on the internet and what the implications were. Yeah, I think I had a Facebook account for sure before I was 13 because, you know, you just, 
foot that you're <laughs> that you're over 13 and uh, that's that and they can they can put a warning that says like this is not for kids but you know if you have a friend in a grade above you and all your friends are on that website like really like 12 and 13 is not a meaningful difference in my mind I don't know Heidi if you disagree uh, my child is only a year old so I can't <laughs> <laughs> so um, my my um, elder two are among the youngest in their grades. Uh, they're both summertime babies, and most of their friends obviously had Facebook accounts and Instagram accounts well before they did, because I had asked them both to wait until they were, you know, very clearly, definitely thirteen, because because of what I do, and I didn't want there to be any issues or you know negative juju. Um, but the problem was because they were told that they were too young to do this and because their schools, I mean, we had an, we had an FBI guy in an FBI video come when one of my kids was in seventh grade and they showed this video and a girl, like the video was all about, was basically cyberbullying this girl for taking a selfie and putting it on Instagram um, and it was like showing up all over school and people were making fun of her. And the lesson that the FBI told us to learn from this was you shouldn't put your photo on the internet, not don't cyber bully people who put their photos on the internet. So, you know, I basically said the same thing in the um, FBI presentation. I was asked not to say anything in the next one. Um, but the gist of it is because there isn't access for kids before they turn 13, there is no ability to have this as something in schools. If there had been a transition period between you know, 12 and 15 years old as to certain things that you could access or certain kinds of things that um, had privacy restrictions or something like that, then there would be an opportunity for teachers to build this kind of thing into curriculum. But as I was saying before, you have too many classes that are mixed 12, 13, 14 year olds, so you can't have the students learning how to do this, either instructed by a teacher or even through something like OutSchool, just because they're too young to be able to do this without the parent's permission. And there's too many parents by the time, you know, in 10 years, this won't be a problem. In five years, this won't be a problem. But there's too many parents that obviously didn't grow up with this. I mean, I didn't, but I've been in this milieu for long enough that I was able to sort of like work through certain privacy issues with my kids so that they know when to be careful and you know when not to click on the pop-up ad. But that's not something that there is really any educational um, curriculum-based guidance about. It's not part of civics classes when kids are in sixth grade. It should Heidi, you brought up a really great point about like how, like what your approach has been, but you have this, like you have a legal training and a legal background. Um, and as we have said, like COPPA, um, COPPA is really just kind of shifting um, the burden uh, for privacy onto the parent. So the parent, not only do they have to go through their steps and uh, perhaps provide their credit card information, perhaps provide their uh, government ID, but they also, um, the expectation and like the intent of this bill is for uh, parents to have gone through the terms of service, gone through the privacy policy, um, doing doing the vetting for the app. Um, does anyone raise your hand if you look at the, the privacy policy in terms of service for a website before you access it? I write them and I don't even read them. <laughs> Eric, do you read them? <laughs> yeah, I do not. So yeah, so in addition to the fact that uh, adults, uh, we have to make our own informed decisions and in theory should be looking at privacy policies for our own websites. Um, adults are expected to make um, that decision for children as well, go through all the privacy policies for everything that their kid wants to access. Um, and that is really cumbersome. There was an FTC commissioner that gave a statement earlier this year and she talked about how you know, like she is a parent, struggles with that herself, and she works at the FTC um, enforcing COPPA, and it is a full-time job to actually read privacy policies and fully understand um, where your data is going. Uh, Heidi, do you have any best practices? Like, what are what are things to look for uh, in vetting an app for for kids? So, the ideal is to use something that has the ability, or at least 
purports to have the ability to have your data deleted if at some point you decide you want to be able to ask for it to be deleted. Now obviously for something to be deleted, it doesn't have to be deleted from everywhere. It can be retained for purposes of making sure that you don't sign up for the service again once you've deleted your account or for legal purposes. So you can't use this to get around, you know, being found responsible for some sort of cyber stalking situation. But to be able to down, to delete your information in the event um, the company is sold or in the event the company changes its business model to something that you don't support and you no longer want your data to be something that they have as a commodity. But the problem is that information is so widely sold and distributed by information brokers. I mean, at this point, I don't want to get too far into the police side of things, but at this point, there's no reason 90% of the time for the government to go and get a search warrant or to be able to subpoena data from a uh, from a corporation or even from a nonprofit um, to get information about somebody because you can just buy that data from a brokerage and they will sell it to you for you know pennies on the dollar because that's how they make their revenue. And obviously, you know, this is something that is an issue of concern, not necessarily just for those of us who are worried that we're doing something wrong, but as we've all seen in connection with, you know, the post row situation we're all living in, the data brokerage possibilities of information and combining that information and being able to track that information from the time somebody is 11, 12, 13, 14 is significant, meaningful, and you can't lock the you can't lock the barn after, well, you can lock the barn after the horse has gotten out, but there's no point. So COPPA was last uh, updated in 2013, um, and it does try to provide flexibility to where you don't have to strictly stay with those, um, those verifiable parental consent mechanisms that they've set out. It does allow for some innovation, and companies have been uh, innovating in um, how they estimate age of their users. So um, some things that we have seen that companies are working on include like a, like a, coming up with like a social graph. So like you can infer that if everyone that they are following is in their teens, then you have a good idea that the user is in their teens. Um, another popular tool that we have seen um, start to have uh, more of a place uh, is uh, age estimation using like your face um, so there are some companies that uh, have collected a bunch of pictures of people's faces and used that data to say like, okay, this is the face of someone under 13 and this is the face of someone over 13. Do you guys have any thoughts on um, age estimation using facial I mean, it's, <laughs> recognition? It sounds like a bunch of hocus pocus, but uh, at least like at that age, kids look so I just I don't understand how you can claim that you're you have developed a facial recognition software that you might be able to get it into a range of under twelve or or thirteen or over, but even then like eleven to thirteen, how do you figure out what age that person actually is? And then of course, COPPA requires actual like to to be uh, held responsible under COPPA. Part of the test is that. You have actual knowledge that one of your users is is under 13 then the protections apply but if you have a, an age estimator does that actually count as actual knowledge obviously if it's a baby that's probably pretty obvious <laughs> or if you're like four or five that's probably pretty obvious but once you get into the early tween years it's like i just i don't understand how you can look at a photo of someone and say, oh, that person's 12, oh, that person's 14. It just seems strange. No, those apps keep saying I'm in my 30s, and I love them for it, <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, so the reason why I brought up what some innovations are in this space is because, as I mentioned at the top, um, there's this recently passed bill called the California Age Appropriate Design Code Act. Um, so that is modeled after um, the UK Age Appropriate Design Code, which has been um, in enforcement since last September. Um, so this California bill, it aims to kind of like help protect children online and have like positive experiences. Um, there's been really in the past year or so like a big uh, rallying cry both from policymakers and from parents that 
you know, kids are not having a great time online. Um, they're experiencing a lot of harms, and we want to do something about it, uh, something that goes beyond COPPA. Um, and again, we don't have a federal like comprehensive privacy law. So if we can't if we can't make that happen, perhaps we can um, do something for the children because um, protecting kids online is like a pretty bipartisan effort. Typically, like uh, I don't think anyone advocates that kids should experience harm and abuse online. It's just a uh, matter. The devil is in the details. Usually, like there's broad consensus that that is a good mission, but what that looks like. Um, not so much. So the California bill has already passed. It passed unanimous, unanimously in the Assembly and the Senate, and it is waiting on Gavin Newsom's signature. Um, there's no indication that he's not going to sign it. But again, if he if he doesn't sign it, um, passed unanimously, and they would be able to override that veto. Um, so broadly, what the bill does is it does have some things in it to protect children, um, like data minimization principles like don't collect information uh, that's more than necessary for an online service or product. It also requires a notification like if you are doing geolocation tracking, precise geolocation tracking, you have to give a notification to that child for that duration. I mean if there's parent monitoring tools like if the parent is accessing what they're doing online um, they have to get a notification of that as well. Um, but this bill goes uh, far beyond what is in COPPA right now. So it defines children as under 18 instead of under 13. Um, at the top of the bill, like in the legislature findings, um, people people debate on how much those matter or not. So it's not in the enforceable part of the bill, but in the legislative intent, they would like people to kind of have some nuance between different age groups. So how you might treat a 16 year old should be different from how you uh, treat an 11 year old. Um, and then another very big piece of this is that, as Eric mentioned, COPPA uh, requires actual knowledge and it requires, uh, and it's directed at um, sites that are child directed. Um, but this bill is for any website, service, or product that is likely to be accessed by a child. Um, and there's been a lot of, a whole lot of discussion on what likely to be accessed by a child means. The bill has some indicators for how a service can really work through that. Um, but I think really any website is going to want to at least take a look at this bill and see like what, what compliance burdens do I have, if any. Um, so uh, starting out with the fact that the bill is passed, those are the facts. Um, it is a very divisive bill, and I think some panelists here have some thoughts on the bill and if they're fans or not, whoever wants to go first. Um, yeah, I'll just start with one thing, which is the, the likely to be accessed by children thing. It's mo it seems to, appears to be defined fairly similarly to COPPA's definition for directed to children. So you, you look at the content, you look at the ads, uh, you look at any actual empirical evidence, if you have any, which you rarely do. Um, and then you sort of make a judgment call about whether it's directed to kids. And um, the, so the, the biggest difference here is that at least under COPPA, the age range is zero to 12. So that's like a little bit more obvious to figure out whether something is directed to a child under the age of 13 or not. Um, if you include everyone up to 17 year olds, I'm not really sure how that is, narrows it down significantly like at all. Like, Sure, the Equifax website probably is not likely to be accessed by a child, but or may, maybe an airline site might not be likely to be accessed by a child, but anything social media related obviously is going to be covered under this bill. Every single college has to comply. Yeah. Every single college in the United States has to be compliant because how old are kids when they apply to college? 16, 16 and 17. 17. Oh, well, too bad. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the change in age, even though the definition for likely to be accessed by a child is pretty similar to COPPA, the change in age like completely upends that definition and it doesn't really make a ton of sense uh, with that with that particular age range. Um, but anyway, I, there's other stuff but I'll let Heidi speak to. The only thing I like about this bill is the cure period. Um, is it 60 or 90 days? 90. Ninety. Okay. So there's a 90-day cure period. So if somebody um, brings something to your attention, then at that point you have 90 days to cure it. 
but separate and apart from my IP law work and my privacy law work, I actually also work in the ADA website compliance space. And while I do firmly believe that all websites should be accessible by people with screen readers, fact is there's no federal regulation saying what makes something, something compliant. The WCAG um, guidelines are just that, merely guidelines, and they're old. So there's this whole group of attorneys who file between 15 and 30 lawsuits a day against retailers and stores and hotels and things like that um, and say that their websites are not ADA compliant because their text is not as clear as black text on a white background, which, you know, is a thing that people do um, to make their website more visually interesting. I have a very strong concern that maybe not this California version of the law because it doesn't have, you know, extensive attorney's fees and class action penalties baked into it, but some other state is going to manifest a law that does. Whether it's Florida, I don't think DeSantis is going to follow Newsom down any garden paths that you never know, or whether it's Texas, some state is going to manifest it and that state is going to become a hotbed for these kinds of litigations that may have no merit. And it's just going to be, you know, another, I mean, I'm all for, you know, full employment for lawyers acts, but this one seems to be running the risk of damaging children while giving full employment to lawyers. And that's not a trade-off I'm willing to make. Yeah, I do think the bill has some, some redeeming qualities in terms of, in particular, those data minimization pieces that I mentioned. So not collecting or selling um, information that is not necessary. I think that's something that not just children would enjoy having on the internet, but perhaps adults as well. I think perhaps we all would prefer that information uh, that is collected for one purpose uh, remains for that uh, purpose that it was collected for and not used for a whole host of things. Um, another thing is the precise geolocation information and how that is treated uh, in particular in like a post-ops world. I think everyone has a heightened concern for precise geolocation information and how that's used. Um, but I wanted to flag the most controversial piece of the bill uh, that has been getting most of the buzz. Um, it's on the, the age verification, age estimation component. So uh, the bill, because it's such a big change from COPPA, it has a requirement that you need to estimate the age of users with a level of reasonable certainty, like proportionate to the risk. So it's uh, encouraging people to take a risk-based approach. That part is borrowed from the UK and from the GDPR. Um, we don't need to get into this, but there, there are a lot of like meaningful differences in just like legal frameworks between Europe and between the US. So encouraging a risk-based approach in the US doesn't translate as neatly, um, essentially. And so it, it says that you have to estimate the age of all users proportion to the risk or provide the heightened like child protective measures to everyone that uses your website. Um, so there are some concerns from advocates that that means that now the entire internet is going to be age gated and you might need to like, you know, we talked about uh, innovations in age estimation. You might need to like show your face before you go on any website. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty on what this is going to look like in practice um, because companies do have that option to apply the higher settings for everyone, um, but we, we, we aren't sure what that's going to look like. But that also creates a higher bar for entrepreneurs trying to enter any sort of space because if you have to be able to either license or build this kind of an infrastructure or manifest this kind of a compliance process, then it's going to cost a lot more for you to be able to sell your cookies um, next to a college campus during the summertime when some of the students there are 16 years old for summer programs. And that's a little bit insane. Yeah, I'm one of those advocates that uh, thinks this is going to lead to basically age verification for everybody because if you if you're likely to be access bad child and that's anyone 17 or younger so that's most websites mm -hmm. you have to provide the protections for children to all of your users unless you know the ages of your users and can differentiate between who's an adult and who's a, who's a child mm -hmm. so now you sort of switched the default whereas under COPPA unless you had actual knowledge you didn't really have to do anything um under this, if you're likely to be accessed by 17, by 17 year old, 
you now have you can't profile children. You have to have data minimization for anyone who's a child. And if you're assuming everyone's a child, that means you basically can't really collect all that much data at all. And that's going to sink a lot of business models that have come to be online that is that are mostly targeted advertising related, which requires a lot of behavioral uh, data collection. So now you're talking about basically age gating or age verifying the entire internet. And that is bad for privacy because now you're collecting inf more information about people than you wouldn't that you wouldn't normally have to collect. Uh, and it's bad for <clears throat> freedom of expression and, and First Amendment because anonymous speech is a crucial part of the internet, as I'm sure we all know. And uh, the more personal information that companies know about you, the less anonymous you are. So. It's, it's completely flip, it's going to completely flip the, the default on protecting children. Now, as a privacy advocate, I love the idea of treating everyone as a child and not being able to profile anybody and, and having strong data minimization requirements for everyone across the board, and I've been advocating for that for a long time, but the way we get it here is that companies are going to try to avoid it by then age gaming, so we end up with somewhat of inconsistent sort of the, you're collecting more information to then collect less information about children it's it's very strange it also has the potential to be disastrous for archivists um, and historians because companies that keep you know um, their archival content out you know this is what our website looked like in 2000 or something like that um, won't continue to do that because those elements of their sites will no longer be compliant with this particular statute or they'll have some sort of an overlay on it so it won't look like what it looked like back then anyway. And to be able, you know, speaking specifically, you know, from the perspective of someone who does occasionally need to see what something looked like 5, 10, 15 years ago, it's extremely frustrating to know that I'm going to lose that at some point in the coming years. Um, and I won't be able to access what things look like. We've already lost so much. We've lost Angel Fire. We've lost GeoCities. We've lost AOL Homestead. And this is what we've lost Yahoo groups. And this is going to be one more thing that's going to cause a lot of stuff to get lost. And I hate that. Yeah, there also have been, I don't know if either of you want to speak to this, but there also have been um, some concerns from people that this is just an unconstitutional bill and we should expect that it will be struck down in a couple of years. Do, do you, either of you have thoughts on that? Not very well-formed ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a, a First Amendment expert, but uh, the, the general thought is that this implicates the First Amendment um, and it's kind of like a rehash of what Heidi talked about in the 90s. Um, that, I don't think, is as well settled, and uh, we can only wait and see how it'll play out. Um, also, the fact that we don't have a federal privacy regulation that sort of sets some degree of a minimal standard makes it very difficult for whatever happens at the Supreme Court, because... Um, some of the more recent appointees do go in different directions from each other when it comes to certain kinds of privacy and IP adjacent issues, or at least they did in their lower court rulings. So it'll be interesting to sort of interesting or horrific to see how people, you know, go in that direction. But normally the Supreme Court has looked to federal regulation and debates and things like that in Congress or in state legislatures. And I think here we have a situation where there's a dearth of information in California's analysis of this. Um, the other thing is there have been some recent rulings, not recent, but like between COPPA and now that make it clear that there are certain First Amendment rights that people under the age of 18 have, but they don't have all the same rights as grown-ups. So trying to see how this is going to sort of thread that needle between what was in, you know, the anti-CDA Supreme Court ruling from 97, 98, versus where we are now as a society is potentially terrifying. But we're also, five, like, if this becomes law and Newsom signs it and the next day somebody files a lawsuit against it, we're still four or five years away from the Supreme Court ruling on this, and a lot of damage can be done to entrepreneurs, to teenagers, 
to college students in that time frame, and it's it's a little bit disheartening. Yeah, you brought up the point about the Supreme Court would typically look to federal, like a federal privacy bill. I'm, I'm thinking of that mean, like if we had one, like. <laughs> um, but uh, that raised uh, the point that I brought up earlier. So this is modeled very closely after the UK's version. Um, if you look at the text of the bills, it is fairly similar. Um, but even though the, the text and the substance of the code is similar, they're very different in practice um, because the UK's is meant to uh, complement the GDPR, uh, Europe's privacy law. Um, and it's not like a standalone law. It's not a regulation. Like when it says code, like it means code. Like California's is kind of just like an, a name choice. Um, but in Europe, it is a code of conduct and um, it is meant to work hand in hand with the GDPR. So when you're looking at the, the UK code, it's um, it has the similar standards to what is now codified in California or will be when Gavin Newsom signs it. Um, but it includes a bunch of information like referencing like Article 5 of the GDPR and it's very flexible and it's meant to be um, something that companies work with like on a case by case basis. Whereas here in the US, it is a law and it says this is what you need to do and you need to do it this way basically. Um, and again, because it is a code of conduct versus a regulation, what would ultimately be un enforced in uh, the UK, because it has not been enforced yet, what would be enforced is the underlying GDPR violation. Um, they would look to that and say, okay, uh, because you haven't complied with setting the highest profile or highest privacy profile settings by default, that could be a violation of the GDPR itself. And that is like what the enforcement mechanism would be. Um, so it's much closer to, to a guidance than to a law. And so it's really interesting that here in the US, it's going to be a law. Not only that, but there there is no federal privacy law and it kind of is meant to work hand in hand with the CPRA. Um, but those are again, like the legal frameworks are just not a one-to-one. -one. Do you guys have any closing thoughts? Before we go to Q and A, uh, I think one thought I have is that the bill did get better over time. It was much worse than it is now. Um, so I, there, I guess there's something to be said for that that they did at least listen to some folks on the outside, being like, "This is probably going to ruin a lot of things that you don't want to ruin." Uh, one of the more interesting things about this bill that is a small thing, but I always come back to, it, is that the the privacy policy has to be. Uh, written like written in a way that a child suitable for the suitable for the age of the child which always makes me wonder how do you write a privacy policy for a seven-year-old so here's the fun answer to that you can't yeah. um one of the things about us ip law is something called the digital millennium copyright act which says that if somebody takes your content and they put it like on a forum then the owner of the forum is not responsible for what somebody posted on it. And as long as you send a notification and they take it down, then they can remove it. So back when the GDPR about in 2018, when GDPR was starting to become a thing and some of my US entities wanted to be compliant with it, including Archive Our Own and the Organization for Transformative Works, we had to write a privacy policy in the terms of use that was GDPR compliant, which asked for it to be you know, readable by those, you know, who were reading on like an age level of age 14 or something. You literally can't because the minute you plug in the necessary language for the DMCA, that's an age 16 reading level. You can't do both at the same time. And this is either going to result in a lot of terms of use policies that have like multiple variations of it. And then which one are you supposed to be following or you're going to, you know, and we've already lost two years of reading ability because of the pandemic. Like, kids are not accelerating at the speeds they should be. So, yeah, you can't do that, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess for closing thoughts, I would just say, again, this bill, this bill is coming. Um, and I don't know what would make it not come at this point because it was unanimous. And this, this all happened in, like, one uh, legislative session. Um, so there's definitely like a strong interest in California in getting something done on kids' privacy. But as we flagged, there's issues with the existing uh, COPPA uh, 
pop up law, but uh, there's also issues with how we address kids' privacy going forward. And again, it's very like bipartisan effort, like something that's a really great endeavor, but the devil is in the details and it's a very difficult thing to do in practice, especially when you're trying to do something for that that teen range where teens are going to be accessing a lot of the same content that adults are. Um, yeah, any questions? I hope we weren't too, like, doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the microphone in the middle there is for, for anyone with questions. <clears throat> so for online gambling, they have a similar issue with the geolocation, right? And so a lot of the platforms don't take that responsibility, but they actually have a third-party service that does it for them. So like uh, one, one, one of them is like GeoComply, right? And what they do is they sort of, you mentioned almost age verification, they sort of social graph you to figure out like, are you searching for things in your area? All that kind of fun stuff. Do you see stuff like that? You mentioned social graph, are they doing that kind of stuff or think about that kind of stuff because, as you mentioned, have to gather a bunch of information about a bunch of kids to figure out if they're really kids. Yeah. Um, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, here we all are at Dragon Con. So just because you're looking for information about, you know, Pokemon or My Little Pony, does that mean that you're a kid? Or does that mean you're looking for something for your kids? Or does that mean that you're a grown up with interests in, you know, things that you've enjoyed for years? And a lot of that stuff is masked. So you don't know what it is that they're putting into their, you know, guidelines and their parameters. Because if you knew, then the 16 year olds would A, find a way to get around it, and B, sell those secrets to their classmates. So it works for a limited time, but A, you have to keep changing the parameters, and B, you have to be making buku bucks in order to be able to afford to participate in one of those things. Um, or you have to hope that they have, you know, some kind of a, you know, revenue share thing so that it's only based on what you're actually bringing in. And again, that manifests your personally identifying information in the hands of yet another third party and who knows where they're going to be brokering it to or what they're going to be using it for. I work in the online wagering industry. A lot of that, a lot of the two locations done via IP address or device identification. It's the other parties, the portal parties, part that does a lot of that data collection. Um, so the actual geolocation, it's, I don't want to say it's anonymized, but it's not, it, it, it's traced to the IP, right? It's traced to the gateway in which you dedicate that wagering spot. Um, but not always, in fact, you can connect data if you wanted to, but it's, it's not always that connection. But how can it tell the difference between a 16-year-old student and a 24-year-old teacher? It, so it, it doesn't. Right. It's, the, it's the know your kids. It's the place that's housing the content for that wagering thing that does that. They're just making sure that, okay, this device where they want to do this wagering is within these geo parameters. But you fundamentally have machine learning about a device to imply what's going on there, right? And they mentioned doing social graphs to figure out your age, right? And so with AI developing, it seems like that would be a, the next place to sort of go is how do you sort of figure that out? Because there are certain things that are trends really quickly on teenagers that adults are going to search for, but maybe like a week later. I forgot to add, so this goes into effect July 1st, 2024. There's actually going to be a working group that is mandated by the law. It's called like the children's data protection working group so the working group um it's gonna you have to be a california resident but it's gonna be made up of like like academics and professionals um and people from the industry to put out guidance and recommendations on this and so they will have to um put out their recommendations by january of that year so you'll have you'll have six months with recommendations essentially um to figure out uh what to do about a lot of these questions um because people People have a lot of questions. Uh, the bill leaves perhaps more questions than answers. And I think uh, at this point, people are putting a lot of stock in the working group that all of their questions might get answered, but that 
may or may not be the case. Yeah, I think one of the things you brought up was you know using using data to decide how old somebody is, and at best companies will just use the data they already have. So a company like Facebook might look at the posts that you that you put on your wall or whatever, or Instagram would, would should look at the pictures you have. What we definitely wouldn't want would be companies collecting more data than they otherwise would normally collect to try to figure out how old you are. But if the incentive, which it, I, I would argue is the incentive under this law, is to decide how old somebody is, if you can't do that based on what they've posted or the information you already have, you're going to try to collect more information to figure that out. So um, this law does attempt to get at that by saying that if, some, if a company does collect that type of data, they can only use it for that purpose and no other purpose. But you're still, you know, collecting more data creates more inherent risk regardless of how you're using it. And we know that companies lie about that all the time. And so it's, it's sort of like a half measure. I would prefer companies to just collect less data generally. So. Yeah, and that'll be an issue in Europe's Digital Services Act as well. It, that has the same um, age verification conundrum of like verify ages to make sure that you're giving children the appropriate experience, appropriate privacy safeguards, but also make sure you're collecting the minimum amount of data, no more data than necessary. Uh, and that you're holding it, and that you're only holding it for as long as you need to be able to access it. Yeah, and not a lot of uh, color on how to operationalize that. mentioned like facial scanning for uh, age verification and we've seen problems with that in the past and it, it, to me it's kind of a conundrum if it goes that way then that's more data breaching or more data collection but in order to make informed decisions like such as age verification you have to have multiple data points so how was that going to what are the privacy advocates kind of thoughts on that method of collecting uh, like with the facial scanning or even scanning pictures of online to get that information age appropriate. So, yeah, facial recognition. There's another panel after this one on facial recognition that I'll also be on. Uh, so, facial recognition as a form of verification, as like a one-to-one -one verification, I think is slightly better than basically every other type of use of facial recognition. And the, the, the ones that are the least like, reliable and accurate are the ones that try to infer certain things about someone based on their facial you know, tics or whatever. You know, if you're trying to figure out someone's age or you're trying to figure out someone's disability or something like that, um, just by looking at their face, I think the, those are full of lots and lots of problems. If what you're doing is just verifying someone is the person they say they are and you're comparing it to a photo that you already have of that person that i think uh, as a security measure is relatively non-intrusive and uh fairly reliable but most other uses and forms of facial recognition have all kinds of downsides and problems and one of them is uh, like inherent discrimination and not being able to identify people of color as well or women as well or you know, you know, the technology is getting better, but even once it's perfect, that'll present all sorts of new problems of being able to perfectly identify every person in the country. It's not necessarily something you want as a society or a person. And there's already discriminatory risks that have been documented in photograph situations and even video situations, that there's a presumption, um, you know, people make a judgment that the person that they're looking at is older or younger than they actually are based on the race that they are. So, and there's also a lot of pseudoscience in this realm. I mean, there have been websites or apps that have said, take a photo of yourself and we'll be able to tell from your complexion what you should be eating, please, or what time of day you should be eating, which, you know, they're like, and there's science behind it. There's no science behind it. So to be able to, you know, make those kinds of claims, which is going to result in another level of, you know, FTC regulation and stamping on people for, you know, making, doing false advertising. But all these different, you know, pieces work together. So this act is going to result in 
pseudoscience and keeping kids out of um, databases and websites and apps that they do need to be able to access informationally for school, personally, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the benefits of it are exist, but the benefits could be obtained by doing something that is so much less intrusive than what this legislation is going to manifest. Um, you know, to have some sort of a um, turning off direct messages unless you know the person who is direct messaging you by having some sort of, you know, um, allocation code or something like that, like the way we have here for DragonCon. You can only get a friend code one time. Um, you know, doing that sort of a situation would be a lot easier for kids to then be able to DM each other rather than saying this entire site has to close because it allows DM. And I believe that's something that Instagram uh, did in, in preparation of the UK's version. Um, so we are seeing impacts of the UK's already implemented code here. Um, and then to be clear, the, what is required under this law in terms of like age uh, estimation or age um, verification, it's, it's just you have to estimate the age of a user with a reasonable level of certainty. So Heidi brought up some like some weird like pseudoscience like what is technically likely uh, to be seen is that like a service is going to estimate a face but again like there's a lot of like pseudo like uh, junk science products out there uh, that are probably going to be advertising uh, their services in reaction to this um, and those are not what is required under the law but something we might see because sometimes people really like flashy tools. <laughs> An indemnification from some fly-by-night company that hasn't existed for a year has no insurance to back up their corporate entity, their officers or their directors or their claims is not a particularly useful um, indemnification. But luckily, as we were saying before, there's a 90-day cure period in this. This is a great transition for the 5.30 panel on <laughs> facial yeah, recognition. Yeah, everyone just stay seated. In 30 minutes, uh, we'll do a full deep dive into facial recognition. Any final questions? If not, I think that's it. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Make sure you rate this panel on the Dragon Con app and feel free to come up if you have any off the record uh, questions. <laughs>